Hello, everyone, and welcome to the community meeting of the I2P2 Transmark Foundation. This, uh, me, this is held once a month on the third Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It is being recorded, and so this will be available on our YouTube channel as well as on the foundation website uh, within a day or two. The agenda today is, as you see here, we'll go through a number of things, uh, talking about some of the activities of the foundation, uh, and then we'll sum up uh, at the end with a uh, presentation by Ward Weistra from the, the Hive, uh, talking about Glowing Bear. So let's get started. Uh, Diane? Hi, everyone. Happy uh, almost springtime. Um, we're, we're almost there. Um, so good morning or good evening, depending on where you are um, in the world. Um, what I want to start with is um, a thank you to our sponsors. And we actually have a new sponsor to, um, to announce today. Um, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so Rudy, you can go to the next slide. So I wanted to, um, we always, we always we mentioned the sponsors at the beginning of this meeting, but I wanted to organize this a little bit differently um, and kind of let folks know we have like three categories of sponsors. Um, the contributing sponsor program that um, we've talked about a lot that targets the medical and academic um, research centers and, and, and small vendors. Um, and this is an annual contribution of 5,000. Um, so that I think most people are familiar with. Um, we also have a corporate sponsor um, category for a larger uh, corporate um, organization um, that has an annual, suggested annual contribution of um, 20,000. And then, and then we have this category called, we, we just renamed this to sustaining sponsors. And these are organizations that uh, provide significant ongoing financial or um, operational um, you know, support. So I wanna, I wanna do a, a shout out to all three. So Rudy, you can go to the next slide. Um, so here are the, uh, contributing sponsors. Um, we organize it by uh, academic centers at the top. Um, thank you all. Um, and then the vendors at the bottom. So we've got three vendors that are in that category. Um, so next slide. So this is um, this is our our new um, thank, thanks to Takeda um, Pharmaceuticals. They're um, our uh, brand new corporate um, sponsor that. Uh, um, had just joined. Um, we're thrilled to have them as one of our sponsors, um, and we uh, absolutely hope that other uh, organizations in um, in their class uh, uh, join as well. Um, this this gives us a lot of uh, a lot of strength to kind of keep moving things forward. So thanks to them, um, and then of course our sustaining sponsors that um, we we absolutely um, you know need and, and rely on. So uh, DBMI, Harvard Medical School Partners Healthcare. Um, Public Catalyst is in this category, um, and then Axiomedics um, that that also provides uh, significant support for the um, the the Transmart PNC. So thanks to, thanks to all um, very much. Um, and then the next slide is um, just a list of what the sponsor the program um, entails and what the benefits are. Um, I'll mention I'll just mention the, the two free tickets to the foundation event. Um, so our, our June meeting and, um, and hopefully if we can uh, pull together a, a European meeting in the fall, um, that will be, that will support that. And, and of course, recognition and, um, and, and uh, many other um, things. Um, so next slide. Um, I just want to mention, and actually you can go to the next slide, Rudy. The, the uh, AMIA meeting in San Francisco is next week. Um, that meeting is always chock full of uh, lots of, you know, great uh, informatics um, sessions. There's always, always things on um, I2B2 that um, that I don't even know about because sometimes it's not in the title or the description of the of the session until you, you know, you land there and you realize that uh, these people are are using, you know, I2B2 or Transmart um, to uh, to support their um, their cases, but. Um, we don't have an event there. We don't have a formal event there this year, but we are pulling together people um, to join us for dinner on Thursday night. Um, I've sent out notices and, and certainly um, hope to, to get a, a large group of people. So if you're there and you're interested in joining us for dinner on Thursday, um, send an RSVP to, RSVP to me and I'll uh, make sure that I uh, 
let you know the, the time and location of the, of the dinner. So next slide. So we will mention the, um, the working groups and then Mike Mendez will have a couple of things to say about the ETL group. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So just a, just a reminder, um, these are the working groups, user interface, ontologies, ETL, and, and use cases. Um, and then of course we have the events and, and training um, working group that, um, that Rudy um, runs. So the next slide, and do we have Mike on the, on the line? Yes. Okay, I'll let Mike uh, Okay, Mike, you should be unmuted, Mike. Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? There you go. Yes, sounds good. Okay, great. So yeah, we've had an exciting uh, last couple of months. Actually, it's been going on for, I guess, almost a year now, the ETL group. So I want to point out some, some stuff that we have. So we have a GitHub repository. Um, it's uh, right there on the link. And on that, we have two main things. We have some ETL scripts that we've developed. And these ETL scripts are mainly used for after you've done your load, and a way of validating the data. Um, so what it does is it counts the number of patients in the patient dimensions, it does counts in the observations, does validation of your concept dimension, I believe. Um, and it does like uh, checks to see like how many users you have, uh, the counts of them. Uh, there's a good like 30 different things that, that checks. And uh, so after you do your, whether it's monthly or quarterly load, you can run these and then validate that the numbers are similar to the increase from last load or that if something like zero for the patient dimension, then yeah, instead of rolling it out and then finding out in real time uh, when it goes live that these issues. Uh, the other thing that we did was we developed some documentation. So basically, this was uh, pre-ETL. So what to look for when you're doing an ETL. Uh, and you might think, oh, yeah, just take the dish, shove it right in. Well, there's a lot more to that. There's date constraints that you need to understand. There's uh, numeric values, whether you can deal with modifiers and stuff like that. So we're always open to people uh, testing out some uh, scripts or uh, giving us recommendations of documentations or providing new documentation. So that was kind of uh, the goal for what we wanted to get done in the first year, which I think we kind of completed. So the next steps is now that we have some scripts and some documentation, we're looking at some way that we can develop some type of ETL process that could be used across both platforms. And one thought we were looking at was we were going to create a standardized, uh, uh, standardized uh, um, data format. So you have like a table for medications, labs, procedures. And then from there, uh, because it was in a standardized format, that would then be able to load it into the like to be to transform uh, databases without much issue. Uh, for the end user, all they would have to do is map their data, their uh, their EHR schemas to the standardized format, and that would be on like the first step. And once they do that, the rest of it should just run through without any issues. Um, and so we'll also look at the Transmart 18 release and how they're doing their ETL work. And we're always open to other suggestions. Uh, like Diane said, we have 23 members. Uh, we meet the first Tuesday of every month. Uh, it's at 10 o'clock in the morning, Eastern time. So you're welcome to join um, on the, I wish I posted it. Uh, we have on the community website, the, the wiki for the ETL, which uh, specifies where the location of the uh, webinar is and the time and stuff. Uh, you don't have to be a member to join. We're open to anyone, everyone. Come join us, uh, suggestions, help, anything, okay? Uh, I think that was it. I think we put the two screens onto one, so that sounds great, okay? Great, thanks, Mike.
Now we'll move on to the use case uh, working group. I think Peter, you're going to walk through this. Hello, yes. Good morning, everybody. So the use case working group is is uh, a relatively new working group. We've had a couple of meetings so far. Uh, we have 18 members, uh, most of them really pretty active. Our first task has been to set up um, building some use cases that we can uh, use for various purposes. So we're looking at uh, success stories where we can show how um, each of the three platforms has been used, um, where the benefits are, what they're particularly good for, uh, some places to go to for more information on uh, on how to get the best out of them, and also more technical use cases that we'll, we'll come on to in the coming months. So to kick this off, we're preparing a survey um, we had a discussion on it yesterday. We're just uh, tweaking it this week, and we'll start sending it out um, early next week. We need some test cases, uh, some some test users to test the survey. So we're first of all going to test it on ourselves, which will give us 18 people filling it in for all of the servers they have. Um, we thought ideally we would then test it on you guys, so we'd send it around the foundation membership, um, where clearly people have a, a real interest in each of the three platforms and gather as much information as we can. It's looking to be a survey that's going to be easy to fill in, so we don't want anyone to be put off filling it in, collecting the basic details. What do you think was a real success in uh, the installation or installations that you have? And uh, also what issues you might have that you'd like to, to note so we can see what uh, common requirements there are. We're looking forward to the, uh, the Harvard meeting in June where we're hoping we'll have use case presentations for some of the success stories that show particular highlights for each of the three platforms. And we'll also be collecting more use cases from the people attending there. Um, we'll try to catch them and find out what they're doing with I2B2, with Transmart and with I2B2 Transmart, and uh, gather that information up. And the chairs of the working group, I should say, are Kendra Elliston from Axiomedics and myself from Axiomedics, so we're part of the uh, the sponsorship that, uh, that uh, Diane mentioned at the start. Okay, <clears throat> super, thank you, Peter. So you will be hearing from us. Great. Okay, um, moving along, um, we mentioned the Harvard meeting a couple times now, so let's talk about it. Uh, the Harvard Symposium um, it's become an annual tradition in June. Uh, held at Harvard Medical School. This year, the dates are June 17th and 18th. A uh, little bit different um, venue. We're going to be at Simmons University, which is kind of uh, adjacent to the Countway Library, where a lot of things were held last year. Um, and we've put together uh, an agenda, which uh, you can see here. We've got uh, several keynote speakers, uh, John Brownstein, uh, talking about uh, incubating innovation in an academic medical center. Uh, David Chewitz is going to give his perspective uh, from novelty to necessity. Uh, data science and technology and pharma R&D. Uh, he is from Takeda uh, Ventures. And then uh, Sebastian Schneeweiss will be talking about healthcare databases and evidence uh, on effectiveness uh, of medical products. Um, we're looking forward to having to hearing these, uh, these, these talks. Uh, Zach will uh, open the meeting, give us a welcome, and give, again, his, uh, his uh, always interesting perspective uh, sort of on where things are and where things are going. Uh, Sean Murphy will discuss uh, I2B2 futures um, in, a, in a session, and Paul Viak will give us the latest on uh, I2B2 Transmart. Um, the rest of the time that first day, we're going to be spending mostly on case studies, uh, a number of Folks have uh, stepped up and offered uh, to discuss their, their use cases in their laboratories, uh, you can see here. And uh, hopefully uh, a, a good part of this will be uh, just talking about where, you know, how the, the different platforms uh, are used in their laboratory. Uh, hopefully some success stories, you know, on different uh, types of projects uh, and give us all, you know, some, some better feel for you know where different people are using the platforms and what they're, they're using, what types of research they're doing uh, with them. Uh, we have a, a very you know full agenda at this point, um, but um, if uh, you know if, if you are interested in participating, uh, we're also trying to organize a poster session, and so we can certainly take uh, 
uh, quite a few posters uh, if you're interested in uh, also presenting. So if uh, if you are, if you go to the website, there are uh, there's a place to submit your um, your proposals there. The second day, uh, we are going to have the working groups. Uh, we'll have sessions. Uh, we're still uh, sorting through what the exact times for are for all the, the different sessions and trying to pull these together. Um, so the working groups will though meet and uh, have a face-to-face -face discussions. Uh, the ACT uh, this discussion group, uh, similar to last year, will be a half a day session. Uh, and uh, that will be uh, also open uh, and I'm sure interesting to quite a few people who are, are attending. And then uh, as usual, we will have a foundation platform uh, open discussion um, where we will um, really uh, try to you know, give uh, a brief updates uh, on kind of where we are, where some of the, the, the platforms are going, but uh, especially have open uh, question and answer periods where we can discuss uh, any issues that, uh, that the people uh, attending uh, have. Uh, another session, another, another topic is, is going to be uh, how to contribute uh, code and plugins to the various platforms. And so that will be something that we're adding uh, to, the, uh, to the meeting. So we're, we're very excited. Um, we, I will tell you that attendance, uh, the, the registrations are low. Uh, this is usual uh, for our, our meetings, unfortunately, but uh, we ask you if you are planning to come, please register soon so that we can plan uh, on uh, things like food and all for the, the sessions. Um, and uh, we'd appreciate if, um, you know, if you can uh, register as soon as possible. Uh, that is uh, on the website, then uh, you can register uh, there. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to give a, a couple of quick updates on releases. Um, I2B2, you heard last time Mike Mendes presented the, um, the updates for uh, I2B2 1.7.11. Uh, a lot of uh, enhancements were made uh, also to the, uh, to the web client, a number of additions uh, to the web client. Um, but um, one of the, the highlights uh, has been a new license uh, switching to the Mozilla MPL2 license, which brings uh, I2B2 into a, a, um, uh, a uh, uh, you know, sort of accepted uh, open source license uh, and, um, you know, is, is, a, is a much more um, uh, well understood and well used license uh, in the community. Uh, and that means that, um, you know, for folks interested in uh, development and, and making contributions. Uh, hopefully, it'll be a lot more uh, interesting and um, for going ahead. So uh, those are the the enhancements in I2B2, and uh, that is available today. Uh, also, um, I will mention that uh, there are um, quite a few I2B2 plugins uh, that have come uh, and. Um, you know, making code contributions um, to I2B2 largely is done through plugins. These are, you know, kind of standalone pieces that uh, can be added to your, your deployment. Um, I will mention that, you know, the, um, you know, those of you who've released it on the, the old uh, Brigham and Women's uh, license, uh, this might be a good time to, re to consider uh, moving it to the new MPL2 license. Um, and that's, that's something that uh, we're happy to help you with there and discuss with you. Um, and as I said, we will have a session on, you know, how to contribute um, plugins uh, at the uh, at the June meeting. Uh, also, want to just mention that I2B2 Transmart is uh, about to be released. Again, we heard about this uh, in the last um, session or two. Uh, Jason Stedman presented. Um, the quick start guide for uh, I2B2 Transmart has been out. This is a, a platform that lets you really have a, a simple in implementation and, and uh, really get a, a feel for what's in the, the product. The production version um, is, is really designed to be a uh, much more rigorous uh, deployment. Um, uh, does take a little more effort, of course, but also can support uh, a large uh, databases as well as a large number of users uh, using the system. Um, and um, really, you know, allows it to come in to be plugged into a, an institution, institutional deployment. Um, this is about ready to be released. Um, so it's expected in the next week or two that this will be uh, the production version and all the guides for how to, to do the deployment will be released very soon. Um, and 
since we are releasing it in 2019, uh, following our naming conventions, um, we are renaming this to release 19.1. And so when you see uh, I2B2 Transmart platform, the release number when it's when it's finished and released, it's going to be 19.1. Okay, uh, and so um, with that, um, we would like to now switch to uh, our uh, another guest speaker that we have, uh, Lord Weister from The Hive, is going to give us an update on Glowing Bear, uh, which we've, we've heard a number of times here at these sessions. Uh, it's, it's, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of improvements, a lot of enhancements to it, uh, and it also is the topic of one of our training classes in April. And so, uh, what I'll do is turn this over to Ward, and um, let's see if we can get. Uh, I think I just presenter. switched. Uh, Did you do it? I think okay. I just switched myself. Yeah. Cool. Okay. It's a, it's a new feature of GoTo Webinar, I think. Ah, you're giving me way too much power. That's... Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So thanks so much, Rudy. Um, thanks for the opportunity to indeed uh, show a bit about Glowing Bear. Uh, and as Rudy mentioned, I think um, this is kind of an introduction to um, a training class we'll give later. Uh, Rudy, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it April 29th? Uh, maybe we can look yes, it up. Yes, that's exactly right. Yes, that's right. Okay. And um, registrations are open. So you can register for that trading class now. Very good. So I'll do a brief introduction here. I'll try to limit it to, to 10, 15 minutes. Um, and I'll introduce you to Glowing Bear. And Glowing Bear is a, a new user interface that works on top of Transmart, uh, um, on the latest version of Transmart. And um, uh, it's all an open source product. Um, and it's a little bit more modern than you used to in previous user interfaces from, uh, from Transmart. So my name is Ward Weist. I work at The Hive. Uh, the Hive is a company around open source software providing uh, professional support around that. And this is one of the products that we actively support in that. Um, and starting with Glowing Bear, I first want to show a bit like who is using this. Um, this is a picture that I took last year. You can see that it's December because we have Christmas trees and Christmas stars here. So at the end of last year, we had this um, Glowing Bear user meeting in the Netherlands. Uh, we had mainly party from the Netherlands there, uh, but also some some German friends and some French uh, French friends. Um, so you see many logos in here. Of course, the Hive works with it. Um, this is the, the Children Cancer Hospital, also here in Utrecht. Um, the Dutch Twin Registry, so we register with all twins from the Netherlands, uh, is using this actively. Um, and then there's some large uh, projects using it. So this is IMI Pioneer, um, one of the big uh, Rise in 2020 projects. There's the Future, the German Medical Informatics Initiative project. And of course, uh, Peter Rice was here from the ITV Transport Foundation and, and some others. So I just wanted to give you a bit of perspective on that. Um, and then starting from what is uh, Glowing Bear. So when we're uh, deploying Transmart for our customers, we often see a similar kind of need where there's many different data sources being in, in a hospital or more in a, in a clinical trial in a pharma setting. There's many different data sources where data comes in and you want to make this available to your researchers in some standardized way. So that's where a nice data warehouse like Transmart comes in for ITP2. Um, so we help them build these automated pipelines to get the source data into, into the data warehouse. But then, uh, depending on your use case, you don't directly want to give all the data uh, access to everyone. So sometimes you first want to start with a uh, very light way of exposing your data, maybe just code books. Um, and for this, we're using data catalogs. So for example, this is the data showcase that we worked on with the NTR, very much inspired by the UK Biobank data showcase, um, where you see a nice searchable overview of all uh, variables within your data sets, but without giving away any patient level data. And then the researcher can use this to search variables of interest, um, add them to the shopping cart. You see here is 12 variables added to the shopping cart, and then um, they can start a request, a very, very well informed request without emailing back and forth what data is actually available. And then, of course, from there, um, the user needs to be able to request that data. So you go into this back and forth with um, identifying yourself and uh, getting access to the data. And then eventually once the data, um, uh, once the access request is approved, um, 
we can use Glowing Bear to be able to select the data of interest. So either the data manager can use Glowing Bear or um, the, you can give access to the user directly um, with Glowing Bear. So what is Glowing Bear? Glowing Bear is a modern cohort selection interface um, and it supports all the new features from the latest trends market, so time series, samples, cross study analysis. We're really inspired by using both the features from ITB2 and from Transmart together. So both from the um, clinical trial world where you have different studies where you need to be able to set differential access and where you have this kind of uh, baseline week one kind of relative time series but also the EGR setup where you have a big data set of, uh, of data where you have a lot of ontologies in use that you need to be able to see and, and this real-time data. Um, we're focusing mainly we started on this cohort selection and data selection um, but now we're also bringing back all the advanced analysis in there and the export functionalities. And authentication is done via a separate uh, uh, key cloak application, um, which is really easy to integrate with any identity management system you already have. As I mentioned before, it's fully open source, available on GitHub and under the same license as, as I2B2 is now. And from here, I'd like to move to an actual uh, demonstration. So first, I encourage you to go to glowingbear.app. That's the website where we have all the information on the, on the card selector. Um, first of all, on the home page, you have a quick walkthrough, you have uh, features described, and you have the roadmap. Um, and then, if you're a first time user, you probably want to get to getting started. There's a few parts in here quick start guide, um, user manual with the full explanation. Technical details are also added recently there, so how to install it, and also uh, a full architecture diagram, database diagrams, those kind of things. Um, but today I'll walk you through two tutorials that we put on there recently um, with these two kind of different um, use cases. So this is more the use case from the ITB2 side where you have this hospital-like data. And this is more the use case from the Transmart side where you have this clinical trial kind of data. Um, it's really open source. So here's the link to the code. And here's also the link to our public demo server. So um, if you click this, you go to glowingbear.hive.net public server. Um, if you don't have a user account yet, you can click here, register for your own account, and then you'll get an email um, and, and be able to do all the queries that you want. Of course, I already have an account here, which I will use to demonstrate this. So when we come in, um, it might look a bit more fresh, but it probably is quite recognizable because we have the nice data tree here that we're used to from both products on the left. Um, this gives a full overview of all the different data types, so numerical data, categorical data. Um, from the Transmart side, there's all the study data available. Um, and you can search in this and find any data that you're interested in. And we see already counts here for the patient level, of course. Um, we use this to make our data selections. Uh, currently, our data selection is empty, but we use the data selection tab here to make that selection in three different steps. First, we select all our patients that we're interested in. Once we have those, we can go to the second step and select for those patients only the uh, concepts that we're interested in. Um, and once we have this kind of Excel sheet of data, we can view that in a grid view, go to analysis or go to export. So quickly walk through basically these two kind of use cases. Um, so first of all, once I have, um, so, so for people more from the Transmart side, you're familiar with this public studies, private studies. Um, and um, you used to be able to select data from only one study, but now you can select data easily from multiple studies. So now I've just dragged the study in here. If I click update, I've selected all 12 patients for this study. But I can uh, add other studies here and, and keep selecting more patients. But we can also harmonize data over these different um, over these different studies. Um, for example, in this case, we have a number of relapses harmonized over these multiple sclerosis studies. So we can select everyone from these studies who have at least one relapse. So you see already the values are between zero and six. So let's put between one and six in the in the stat, and you see we have 15 subjects left. So this is a quick overview of how to use. Combination constraints studies and these numerical uh, selections. If we have clinical trials, um, we can also uh, now in a new transmart use time series in there. 
so when I'm searching for um, heart rate, you see that in this study, which resembles kind of clinical trial, we have um, three patients that have data for heart rate. It's a very small test study, this. Um, if we say, okay, everyone who had a heart rate over 80 at some point, we only have two patients left, but then we can start filtering within that and say, okay, I don't want them to have at any point uh, a heart rate over 80, but already at baseline, their heart rate needs to be over 80. And you'll see that we have only one subject left. So this is really the, the Transmart kind of use case. Um, if you're more familiar to the ITB2 kind of use case, um, I have here a nice uh, population study called synthetic mass, uh, representing the um, population of Massachusetts in 2021, I believe. Um, and where we can quickly do selections like, um, okay, give me everyone who was born before, let's say 1950, or after 1950, sorry. Um, so we have 971 patients. Um, and if we want to do a selection on that, maybe we're interested in only patients who had recently had diabetes. So um, we could directly search in here on diabetes, but um, I'd also like to show the ontology support. So here I'm going to buy a portal and looking up the, the SNOMED code for, for diabetes. So I can type that in here in my search box and find quickly that we have three hits in there. So you see this is three times represented in the SNOMED SNOMED hierarchy, uh, we can use it here, or we can search directly in here and find all uh, concepts related to that. So now I've selected everyone who was born after 1950 and had diabetes, but we can filter on this real-time data um, saying, okay, they need to have diabetes within the last, let's say, 10 years. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. We still have 11 patients left. So this is more the ITB2 kind of use case. Um, and so this is our patient selection. Once we have that, we can go to the second step and um, we see the same tree as we had here on the left. But if we click update, you'll see that this tree is filtered to show only nodes in the tree that actually still have data left. Um, so this is really useful to get to an interesting data set rather than ending up with an empty data set. So let's say we're interested in all demographic Calculate how many observations do we have for that? Oh, this is a rule. Let's just focus on the demographic data first. Okay, so we have 66 observations here, and you see that we've now defined uh, a patient set here. And now we have this kind of Excel sheet of data. We can go to the grid view and see a table like representation of that data. Um, we can also go to analysis, but I'll show you that in a moment and we can go to export and create TSV files from that. Um, so this is the first primer on Glow and Bear. Um, we should probably save some something for the, for the actual training. Um, I do want to show you quickly two features that are coming up. Um, one of them is coming out in about a month, which we'll call Glow and Bear 2.0, um, where we currently are only able to ask questions based on patient level so multiple things need to be true within the same patient but for our uh, cancer hospital here in the netherlands we're building a feature where you can also search on um, multiple things that need to be true within the same bio source or biomaterial so basically different types of samples different levels of samples so you can really find samples of interest um, and the next thing you can do is also um, store that selection. So either on patient level, what you see here, or on, on a different sample level, and then subscribe to this query. And every time data be, is being re-uploaded, you can get an email every day or every week with, uh, there's three new samples added to your uh, query of interest. And finally, something which will be coming out shortly after that um, is the integration of Fractalis. Um, so that you probably heard about this already. Uh, Fractalis is the visual analytics uh, interface that was built by the University of Luxembourg. Um, and I'll quickly show you a few pretty plots and that's probably where we'll have to end it. Um, so I'll quickly add a box plot here um, with one numerical variable and then a categorical variable to break down into different groups. 
So we get this nice plot. Um, it's all interactive. There's all the statistics here. You can show points and do pretty density estimations, etc. But it really starts to shine when you add some more plots to this. Um, for example, we add a scatter plot here of numerical 10 against numerical 11. Please forgive the not too interesting sample data here. Uh, we have a nice uh, scatter plot here. We can move things out of the way if they're in there. Uh, but this really shines when you select uh, uh, a certain set in one of the plots, you will see the other plots update based on the selection that you've made. And similarly, when you have multiple cohorts, you can instead select, um, instead of the one cohort that I currently have, you can select multiple cohorts, and you will see a comparison here with different figures for the different cohorts that I have, or different breakdowns for the different cohorts that I have. So Rudy, that's the brief overview. I'm not sure if there's any questions. Um, Very Ward, thank you. Very nice. Come a long way. Thanks, Rudy. <clears throat> Um, and these, we can take any questions right now on uh, Going Bear. Again, you can raise your hand. You can put a question in the question window. Um, so I only see a question here from Jim Campbell on the. Yeah, I'll answer board. that. I'll answer that in a minute. Yep. Oh, there's a question uh, from. Cindy Law, is Glowing Bear in Java? Um, that's a great question. So Glowing Bear is written in uh, JavaScript, so in the Angular framework. So I hope that answers your question. And it's really built okay. as a standal standalone application. Uh, there's some more technical information on glowingbear.app, but it's a standalone application indeed built in Angular, um, Angular JS, uh, which talks to the transform server backend. Okay. Great. Thanks, Cindy. All right, great. Thanks. <clears throat> OK. Okay. Um, OK. Yeah, there's another question from Adriano. Um, uh, how does Clone Bear compare to Smart R? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so basically, Fractalis, which you've just seen, Adriano, is what uh, Sasha built as the follow up to um, Smart R. And we're using Sasha's library. Um, so um, we're not reinventing the wheel here. This is the same, which is also being used in ITB to Transmart and in other uh, platforms where Sasha built this in. Yes, yeah, so it's not running smarter. Okay, great. Um, could you give me a reference of more info into the graphics software? Um, I think I can. Um, so Sasha gave me a few pointers to um, Fractalis. If you look at the Fractalis GitHub, um, it's probably the best place to look. Right. Um, so I think it's split into two parts. The one um, has really the analyses. Um, so that can be Python or R. And the other part is the JavaScript, which is actually doing the pretty pictures. And I think that's built into Vue.js, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Vue.js, that one. I think that's it there already. Okay, great. Thanks. And um, we'll be hearing a lot more about Fractalis in the coming weeks as well. Okay, so um, I also wanted to make um, do another little commercial on the training program. Um, we do a training program. Um, we've we've uh, just uh, added up the statistics. We've trained over 500 uh, scientists in the last couple of years um, through this this program. We had our first session in February. Now next week, um, um, Marin uh, Wenberg from the University of Kansas is going to give a presentation on the basics of I2B2. And uh, the in April, um, I guess I changed this around, sorry, but uh, in the, the session that says May here is actually gonna be in April 29th uh, by the Hive. Uh, and so, uh, and then upcoming, there are going to be talks, on, there'll be presentations on ontology, et cetera, uh, as you see here. So please check the website. You can see the up-to-date, um, <clears throat> oops, sorry, I guess I'm not showing my screen. Uh, you can see the up-to-date uh, training schedule and registration for the sessions that are uh, coming up. And um, I encourage you to um, 
to take a look there. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now we can open up for uh, general questions. Uh, I know Jim Campbell has asked the question that uh, the uh, ontology working group has asked for um, a place to be able to put uh, some of the, the work that they're doing in the GitHub, and we have created a, uh, a GitHub repository um, a high, uh, up, uh, overall for the foundation uh, that we're reorganizing to have um, places for the different repos from uh, for the releases of Transmart, I2B2, and then uh, L2B2 Transmart. And we are adding to that the repository. Uh, Jim will be in touch with you shortly. I hope we will have it set up very soon. <clears throat> I hope that answers your question. Um, happy to now open up to any other questions. Um, Diane, you can come back too. Um, anybody has any questions about anything that we've presented today? Again, if you raise your hand or just type a question, I recognize you. Um, Adriana, would you like to talk? I can unmute you. Adriana, I think you're unmuted if you'd like to ask another Hi. question. Can you hear? Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. So it's my pleasure to join the meeting. Uh, it's a nice advance on the Glowing Bear interface. Uh, congratulations to the team in the Netherlands, uh, Ward and his friends. Um, I wanted to know whether there is a planning for a data loader interface based on Glowing Bear. Yeah, Hi, great Rudy. question, Adriano. Um, so um, what we're using for data loading is uh, a combination of a Python package called TMTK, the Transport Toolkit. Um, we're using that for data extraction and transformation. Um, and I think I just sent the link to, to that in the in the public chat. Um, and then the actual loading tool, we call it Transmart Copy, which basically takes um, a format that is very close to the Transmart tables and also the ITB2 tables um, and, and pushes that into the database. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Ward. Uh, thanks, Rudy. So I hope you are all doing well sure. there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, there is a question about um, operating with image data uh, to upload and view, uh, for example, DICOM. Um, and uh, I don't I don't have a lot of specifics. I know there are a couple of plugins in Transmart that will work with a, a couple of imaging uh, databases. I don't remember the details right now. We can get those um, posted. Um, Peter, do you recall anything else there or? Um, maybe Ward. In terms of image databases. Yeah, depending maybe. how quick Peter is, but um, indeed, Transmart had integrations with uh, XNet, the XNet platform. That's right. It's an, yep. an open source imaging platform uh, in two different ways. One is loading kind of XNet metadata into your Transmart instance, um, and the other one was being able to view images from uh, from XNet basically directly with a kind of iframe approach in the, in the grid view. Right. Um, generally, my approach would be that uh, large uh, data, generally I don't bring that into the Transmart database, uh, but I refer to where it lives in a different system. So indeed, loading yep. the metadata from large scale omics or from imaging or wearables only on a higher aggregate level into Transmart and then pointing back to the source systems. Okay. Yep, that, that's exactly it, Ward. So basically, you can load the, the metadata up from uh, from XNet and uh, the viewer just has links and generates links to find the data from XNet. And it could, I think, be fairly easy extended to other um, image systems. Great. But okay. you don't don't actually store the images in Transmart. You store links to how to find them. Okay. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Okay. Um, Diane, want to come back and do the closing? Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for uh, joining us again this month. Um, 
Remember, if you're at Amy next week, please um, look me up. I'd love to, to chat with you. Um, and just one more reminder, if you're coming to our June meeting at Harvard, um, you know, please, please register for the, the conference. That would be really appreciated. So thanks, everyone, and have a, a, a great day.